In this episode of Mind Pump, we answer questions asked by listeners like you. Here's what you do. Go to Mind Pump Media on Instagram, post the question under the qua meme, and then we'll pick the best ones and answer them. But before we do that, we do our introductory portion of this episode where we talk about current events, our lives, and we like to mention our sponsors. Here's what we talked about in the beginning portion of this episode. We start out by talking about self-awareness, the skill and practice of achieving more self-awareness mm -hmm. and why it's important. Do you know you exist? And then I talked about my car getting towed this morning and how furious it made me. It was a good way to practice more self-awareness. <laughs> we talked about a message from one of our listeners in regards to how hemp oil extract helped her brother's autistic symptoms. Now, our favorite company of hemp oil extracts full of cannabinoids, including CBD, is the company Ned. They're the best. They're the ones we chose to work with. We also have a discount for you. If you go to Hello Ned, that's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com forward slash mind pump, you'll get 15% off your first purchase. Then we talked about protein, the magic macronutrient, uh, and why it may have that, uh, that reputation. Then we talked about Viori, the clothing line that we're sponsored by of athleisure wear and why it's so much better than that other clothing line of athleisure wear. I think it's called uh, Boo Boo. Yeah, or something whatever. Like that. Is whatever it Boo Boo? Is that what it's called? Anyway, we have a discount with Viori. If you go to VioriClothing.com, that's Viori spelled V U O R I, and then of course clothing.com forward slash mind pump, there's a code on that page that'll give you 25% off. Then I talked about a study showing how mothers and babies' brain waves sync up. That's kind of cool. We talked about a beer that came out uh, that made fun of the PG&E blackouts here in California. Get him. Then we talked about, uh, what's his name there? Kamal, Kamal Nanjan. I don't know what, what his name is. Anyway, he's, a, he's, a, he's an actor that was a good in job. the Silicon Valley show who got really buffed all of a sudden. So we speculate as to whether or not he's on steroids. Kumel, I think. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, and then we talked about the show, The Marvelous Miss Maisel. Uh, Adam keeps trying to close me on that. So maybe I'll watch it. Then we got into the fitness portion of this episode. This is where we answer the questions. The first question was, is progressive overload super important for hypertrophy? So we talk all about progressive overload, what that means. And by the way, hypertrophy means muscle building. And we talk about how they work together. The next question, this person is saying, hey, I heard that you're at a huge disadvantage if you're tall and you do, and you do squats. Um, what are the things that I can do to improve my ability to squat? So we talk all about effective uh, methods for people who are tall, for squatting and other exercises. Next question, this person says they're addicted to the gym and they go six days a week, even when they're hurt, is this good or bad? Obviously it's bad, but we explain why and we also talk about how they can get themselves out of that cycle. And the final, the follow, the final question, this person has a 65 year old father who's overweight, has arthritic knees, pain in the lower back, wants to know how to get started. So we talk all about how to get this person in this kind of shape uh, on a fitness program. Also this month, MAPS Aesthetic, this is our body sculpting, bodybuilding bikini competitor program. This is the program designed to help you train your body and sculpt your body as you see fit. What does that mean? That means you look in the mirror, you identify the body parts you want to focus more on, you look at yourself and say, okay, I would look better with better shoulders or, or glutes or quads. Then you go in the program. There's a way you can plug that in so it's unique to your body. Then you can follow the whole program as it's laid out. Super effective. It's 50% off all month long. Here's how you get that discount. Go to mapsblack.com and use the code BLACK50, B-L-A-C-K-5-0, no space, for the or one of, if not the most attractive quality um, about Katrina and Katrina and I's relationship <clears throat> that um, I just, I, I adore it. I, I try and remember that I'm, I'm so grateful that I have a partner that's like this because that is the, the thing that's so cool is, you know, we're like anybody else. We have disagreements and arguments and, uh, and that stuff happens on a, on a semi-regular basis. But it's the way we handle it that is so cool is, you know, I, fuck, yeah, last night. Last night, um, you know, I, I come home. Last Yesterday is a day where I get up uh, extra early to get Max ready and around because she she's back to going to J.J. Albany's. <clears throat> and so I'm up early, and I, and I spend the, the morning with him, getting him kind of ready for when the nanny gets there. And then uh, long day at work. We've got a lot going on here and stuff. Then I come home. 
soon as I come home, I'm, I'm kind of playing with him and doing stuff. I, you know, take out the trash, clean the, clean the house, do some dishes to kind of help out with her. Cause I know it's a work day for her. So she's busy and I'm, and she's also got family over and, you know, I, and I'm exhausted. Justin and I fucking, we, <laughs> we thought it would be a good idea to do uh, 10 sets of 10 of 225. Yeah. Um, wow. Smart. That's real smart. That sounds yeah. like a terrible idea. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, tap, I, ta- I tapped out early and then Justin had to do yeah. one more set My, just to be an asshole. Justin's not, he's not competitive like, at all. Asshole. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah so, ah, I can't help it. Uh, and so I'm like, I'm exhausted. Right. And so I, I, I creep upstairs for one minute and I like, I lay down in the spare bedroom with my face down with my clothes on and everything. Just to, like close my eyes for a minute. I'm tired and she comes in with max and she's like can you take your son and i was just like inside of like angry about it you yeah. know like i was like fuck you you see what the day i've had too and i've sure, totally sure. been supportive of help what i love though is i can be like i didn't say no i just looked at her and said like are, are you gonna bring him to me right now like that and she just kind of walked away and she walks away initially i know that i'm probably frustrated initially i know she's frustrated immediately within minutes after that i'm going like okay seeing it from her perspective uh sure you know and, and like right away starting to become aware of my part in this and 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 see that and and then i pop up like maybe five ten minutes later to go find her with, with him to take him from her and say fuck i'll get to sleep later whatever and when i go do that she's like no hon it's okay i know you've I, and she kisses me and says like i got him and stuff like that i know you've helped out a lot today and I and what I know about her because obviously we've been together for so long is that she does the exact same thing. Initially, she probably was irritated with me, mm-hmm. but then she walks away and goes like, "Wait a second, I know he just." So, are you responding to her like, "Hey, look, I know you've been working, you know, been with the kid, you know, all morning or whatever, and I should, you know, whatever." So, you guys are both doing that basically. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's and what that is is it's it's this unbelievable amount of self self awareness and social awareness that that we both have, and that's been an, an area that has always been important to both her and I. Um, for, yeah, it makes it easy when when or not easy. I shouldn't say that. It's always hard. It it makes it easier when both people step away mm-hmm. and give each other the opportunity because you ever be in a situation where you're, you know, whatever you're frustrated, but then because you're getting pushback, it doesn't give you the opportunity to examine. But it's cute. It's it's or it's key that the the parties both. Are are very self aware people that when they break, instead of going and trying to confirm their their belief, yeah, or, I'm so mad at him, or I'm right, mad at her. or or reach out to a friend and be like, can you believe him, blah, 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 and do shit like yeah. that, they go like, okay, fuck, what, how could I have done that better? Where, where? That is such a hard skill because it requires uh, vulnerability. Mm-hmm. Because for you to do that, it means that you're taking the there's a potential that she will not do the same admitting you might be wrong and not yeah. only that yeah. but it's you may think to yourself oh, okay what i did was wrong but she may never think that what she did was wrong so you are vulnerable because you're like okay i'm going to step forward and do this without any guarantee that she's going to do the same thing and that's a hard thing right. to do that that's a, a lot of it too and i experience this in my relationship all the time it's like you have to you know, be okay with the fact that whatever you want to bring up sometimes, like you have to let them discover that. And, yeah. You know? And so like, I, I, oh, I want to point this out, like how wrong you were in this situation. Yeah. But you know, a lot of times I just mm, I have to like, you know, step out, step away Dude. and then let them discover that fact. And then it's great because if you do have the right partner, they will come to that conclusion, come back to you. You can have a discussion about it, but to hammer them is so counterproductive. It does. It just so. Uh, Doctor John Gottman is the foremost researcher on relationships, um, and a lot of what he says can be boiled down. And there's specifics, but generally, a lot of it has to do with you know giving yourself the ability to be self-aware. And so one of the, so this is what he did, um, and I, I I really going to try and get this guy on the show, but I think it's almost impossible. Yeah, I hope so. But I yeah. But one of the, so what he did is he had something he called the love lab and it was an apartment with cameras. He would have couples come in, he'd hook them up to heart rate monitors and all these other stuff. And then he'd have them live there or discuss difficult situations. And he did this for 20 years. And the, the results he came up with, the conclusions he came up with have been duplicated, I think four or five times, which for behavioral science, for psychology, um, scientists in that field will tell you it's very hard. It's one of the worst 
scientific fields in terms of duplicatable research because they'll have a, a result of something oh, like if they... you act this way, whatever, this is the result. Then someone else will conduct the same study, different result. Mm -hmm. Well, his has been actually duplicated several times and not by him. So you know what he's saying. Wow. Yeah, uh, There's a lot of truth. And so one of the things that he did, which was brilliant, is he'd have a couple come in, they'd hook up their, you know, their, they'd see their heart rate and all that stuff. And he'd say, okay, I want you guys to discuss a subject that you guys have been having uh, trouble over. So that, you know, maybe the wife brings up, you know, you don't help around the house or the husband says something like, you know, you always, you know, whatever. And then he would sit in the back and they would observe and they'd watch both of their heart rates start to elevate. Cause you know, as you get angry, he calls it flooded. As you get angry and emotional, heart rate, you know, starts to be, and you can see on the monitors. Then what they would do, and this is totally brilliant, is he'd come in there, he'd interrupt the fight or the argument, he'd say, hold on a second, our machines went down. Can you guys take a second? Yeah. Let us fix the machines real quick, and then you guys can reconvene. Even though they didn't. Even though they didn't. Yeah. So then what he would do is he'd go back into the lab, and they would wait until the heart rates came down. However long it took, if it was 30 minutes, five hours, he'd sit there and wait and wait and wait. And as soon as the heart rates came back down, he'd come back in and be like, okay, everything's working yeah. again. And they could have a rational conversation. And the the success rate of the couples uh, in terms of being able to understand and hear each other and resolve their issues, or maybe not resolve their issues, but it not result in a massive blowout, was like, I mean, it was astronomical. It was like 78% versus like 5% or 10% when both people are, are flooded or angry. So that's such an important thing is for you to... Now, didn't that... St I thought I read that or watched that too. Uh, didn't didn't it matter too on the couples that were meant to be or, or, or would last would have that success like that, right? Okay, so there were... Right, wasn't there? Wasn't there's it? certain things that he pointed out. Um, and his book, I'll pull up his book. So if you're if you're really interested in this, I highly, highly, highly suggest it. No, his stuff is fire. It's the, yeah, it's the most brilliant book I've ever read on relationships because uh, it's very pragmatic. The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. So he identifies a few things that through 20 years or 30 years of study, if he saw these things happen in an argument, uh, he could predict within five minutes, within five minutes of watching people interact with something like 80 or to 90% accuracy, whether or not they'd be together in five years, just by doing these things. Um, and so uh, absolutely phenomenal, but it, it's key. It's so key to step outside of that, you know, e emotional space to become more self-aware because when mm -hmm. you're angry or upset or hurt, your your your, your self-awareness goes or at least your willingness to become self-aware it goes out the window because all you're doing is feeling you know, all these emotions ways you can exercise that too is to and it reminds me of the time we live in right now with uh the internet and and getting flooded with information that just confirms your own bias uh and how important that is to seek out uh the opposing ideas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so i always like to find somebody in my circle, whether it be a friend, a family member, somebody who I know would side with her. So I can, so I can like, even if I feel a certain way about something, like I don't want to go talk to my friend who's going to be like, yeah. oh, screw her, man. Right. Who's going to side with me. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. I, I already know he's going to confirm how I feel. That's yeah. not going to help me make my way through the situation. I want to find somebody in my circle that I know is going to identify with her or side with her side of the argument so I can then work it out that way and sure. have a conversation. And but at the end of the day, you have to be willing right. to hear that. That's the self-awareness yeah. piece, right? That's the piece that, that, that's the first step in it is you care enough, which again, to me, this is also the, the truest sense or what, what really, what, what love is. Like love is not a feeling, love is an act. And if you truly love somebody, these are the type of the types of yes. steps that you take to yeah, do the, that. The, the, the feeling of love is like the feeling of happiness, sadness, uh, the feeling of motivation. That will come and go. The love is really about action. Right. It's about willing mm -hmm. the good of the other person. And it matters person. the most in the times when it's hardest to... When you're not feeling it. Right, exactly. When you're like, I don't like yeah. this person right now. Right. I'm not it's really it, feeling loving. It's interesting to me because I was uh, thinking about like growing up and, and like being somewhat dependent on my environment, my family, my friends that were like, I grew up with, I had this, you know, preconceived notion of how everything went, like had this specific lens I was seeing everything through. And then, you know, stepping outside that, like going somewhere halfway across, you know, America and getting into a, a completely different environment and having to reinvent myself, no friends, like going through, I just, I, I can't promote that enough. I think that 
you know, especially like through like going, go, growing up, even in through like high school and, and, and just getting out and going somewhere else and having to, to start all over again, it, you learn so much that that's what really like helped me to solidify who I am as a person and, and understand, you know, what self-awareness is like, why, why I act the way I do, how other people perceive that, you know, like how they perceive the world, like all these other variables and factors you just don't get unless you immerse yourself, you know, completely somewhere yeah, else. Yeah. I mean, gosh, you know, for me, it was like while I was going through the back end of my, of when I was married, I could not hear the problems and issues that I was causing. I couldn't hear it. I, I couldn't even acknowledge it. To me, all I could focus on was the stuff that she was doing wrong. And I'm not saying I was the cause of everything. It takes two people. And I think it was pretty balanced in our, in our case. But I couldn't even really understand or fully hear it until I got out of that situation. Unfortunately, I got out of that situation. Years later, I'm trying to be the best father that I can be. So I'm motivated by something different. I'm like, I want to make this the, be the best out of a bad situation. And it was like two or three years of painful self-awareness. You know, oh, yeah. Two or three years of me looking back and be like, fuck. Uh, I, I I see what I did there. Oh shit! I see what I did there, and it's hard. But when you come out of it, you're a better person. You don't repeat, you know, those those same mistakes. Even in my current relationship, the fears that I had that I I carried from my failed marriage and from all that stuff, you know, I carried into my my current relationship, and you know, it definitely was difficult for me to view that. And l luckily for me, Jessica, at some point stepped away and said, hey, look, I don't need a commitment from you. I don't need anything. I'll just mm -hmm. want to be with you, mm -hmm. which gave me the space to, I don't have anything to push up against, right? I don't have anything to push out against. Gave me the space to be self-aware. Once I was able to realize like, fuck, man, I got all these fears. These are legitimate fears. These are, these are, these are fears that are both legitimate, but also at the moment irrational. I have nothing to base them on except for my past relationship. I don't have anything in this current mm -hmm. relationship to base them on. Once I was able to do that, it was like light years, like you just step forward. And that's an amazing thing uh, to feel. But it is hard as shit. Self-awareness, let me tell you, man, hmm. when you're in the middle of your whatever you're in and you're looking out, everything you see and feel, is, is, is that's what you're experiencing. And to, to be able to say yeah. that, oh, what I'm experiencing is probably not right, it'd be like me telling you right now, hey, you know, you know that, that you're living in a simulation or something like that, you know? Yeah. It's like, how can I know that unless I actually step outside of it? Very, very difficult. Yeah, we'd much do. rather be distracted. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a lot easier. Yeah. Dude, days. I had to exercise uh, my self-awareness this morning. Big time. <laughs> yes. Bro. You've been having a little bit of- yeah. uh, Nice of you to get here, finally. Oh. Issues the uh, last few days. <laughs> so, so angry. So, like, uh, you know, what is it? Maybe two weeks ago, Jessica's car gets uh, broken into. So, someone breaks in, rifles through her stuff. She has uh, nothing. The worst she, feeling ever. Yeah. And she's, she's such a violation. Yeah. She's really good. She doesn't leave anything of value in her car because this happened a time before. So this is the second time someone went in, rifled through her shit. I'm like obviously pissed off. I contact the management company of the complex that we live in. I'm like, hey, uh, this is the second time it happened. Also happened to the car next to us at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, plus whoever did it uh, left some stuff on it. looked like a homeless, you know, I don't know, a drug addict did something and you know, took off or whatever. I'm like, we need more security. This is, this seems to be an issue. Nobody responds. Nobody responds. Nobody responds. Email them again, get on the phone. Finally, they respond. And what I get is you can attend the next board meeting. Oh, that's nice. Okay. <laughs> Nobody gives a shit. Yeah. This morning, I park my car in front of my garage for approximately 15 minutes. Literally. I, I, I moved the car out, did a few things in the garage, went inside, got the kids or whatever, go outside, car's gone towed Dude. they towed my car <laughs> these motherfuckers are so fast to do that shit Ugh, but when some gangsters that, yeah so so I, I you know I, I like on the way there i'm obviously late for work you know figuring out how to get my son to school he's got finals so i'm like he cannot be late yeah it, luckily it all worked out on the way there i'm fuming so i'm like exercising <laughs> self-awareness i'm like okay you know, Doing a little breathing. Yeah, I'm like, at the end of the day, I did park my car in a place that, you know. It's a hustle. It's a hustle. Uh, they have, yeah. uh, I remember my place. Um, it's happened to me too. 
they make a deal. Like, so I, uh, my place, I had a, a gated community, which uh, baffled me. How's this happening? Like, how's a tow truck getting in? And it took me probably, you know, six, seven times of getting towed. They before. get a kickback, don't they? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think it costs like, what, three, 300 something bucks, probably? 320 bucks. Yeah. My car. 320 bucks. I had to pay $100 to store my car there. I got there before my car did. They didn't even store it. They pull up with it and I take it. I had to pay 95 bucks. I, I, I've, I've, <laughs> I've This has happened to me so many times. I have so Ugh. many tow stories from the-, the Was eight. this the one where you put, like, you got all the change and put it on Dude, the that's another. Desk? I mean, that's that was another one, story right? I yeah. told on this year. That was uh, that was another situation. I've had uh, I've had times where I pulled my, my truck up to my garage and unloaded my groceries, and then I decided to go to the bathroom and take a shit. You know, it was- 10, 15 more minutes, right? I come out and my, my truck has been towed before. I've had situations where I've parked in it just, just for a minute in my garage and I hear the tow truck because I just ran upstairs real quick and I run back down and they're already jacking up and I had to pay $75 for him to set it back down. Yeah. Wow. Yes. By the way, there's a strategy. There's a strategy Jessica told me about. Wait, so lay, as, lay in front of the truck? No, as we're driving. <laughs> as we're Chain dri- yourself to the bumper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As we're driving there, you know, she's I can tell she's like trying to calm me down because she can hear me breathing or whatever. And she's and I'm like, you know what I'm gonna do? Next time I park in front of the garage, I'm gonna keep the garage open. And if I see them coming, I'll just, you know, whatever. And she's like, What you need to do is get inside your car. Because if they take the car with you in it, it's kidnapping. And they can't <laughs> do that. They're like, oh, yeah, that's true. Huh? Just jump in your car. You know, you, you can't go anywhere. Sit there. Yeah, just chill there. Yeah, I didn't, so I've been hit a bunch of times that's from that. Funny. And, and uh, you know, again, I think that the, the HOAs, like they have, uh, they get a kickback. And so they promote them coming in there. They would actually let the trucks cruise in there like two or three times a day. So they're just driving around looking for people yeah, to pick look, off. looking for someone to pick off. And yeah, so they make their money. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. That is so frustrating yeah i'm yeah i'm so so anyway and i know whatever. you want to go to the the meeting and you want to make a big stink but i i would urge you not to because i think that would just backfire on you because i part of why i think that i got all the shit i got was i was the guy who caused the stink like the first year i bought my house so they picked on you yeah i you know decorated my whole place and i had these red curtains and they of course you did i got a, a, a message yeah <laughs> I got a message saying that it's a love, it's a love house, <laughs> right? <laughs> the Hugh Hefner, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was, everything was white, Decor. With some white red. with red, yeah. Oh my god, bro! <laughs> yeah, all white couches, white fur everywhere, white bed, white everything, and then I had like an accent it's red pillow palace. with the red cur- curtains. But that didn't last long because I got a notice, and they fine you. So I got a notice that said, "Sorry, you can't have red curtains." Uh, <laughs> I hate that. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> what is this communist China? I know. Yeah. <laughs> what? I didn't even know that was a thing. Like I'm I didn't just realize expressing that, myself. I didn't realize that that, that that had to match, right? So I thought that was crazy. That's so, why you pay the fee, dude. You I know. pay the fee. You got to sign the. Th- you oh know? man. So, you know, it's not your house. It feels like that, right? Yeah. It's like it's yeah. not even my house. And I totally, I stalled on. I mean, I waited till the last minute till they were. In fact, I think I paid one fine because what happens is they they give you a bunch of warnings, then eventually they fine you, then they fine you every every month that it doesn't get changed and so, so i think i waited all the way till i got the first fine and then i was just like oh this is some bullshit and oh. then, so i think from that point on like they had a i had a target on my back and i get i used to get towed all oh the no time. i'm gonna go to the board meeting but i have a strategy i'm not gonna share it here because who knows one of them may be listening <laughs> to the podcast but uh i'm gonna yeah. pop in there and uh, you're gonna get you're gonna get the best of me that's all i can say get you a soapbox anyway. dude i gotta read to you a message i got in my dms this is a legit message, real deal message from somebody. Now I want to preface this by saying, um, that we are not making any claims, uh, you know, based off of this message. This is just an anecdote from somebody who, uh, you know, felt like they needed to, to send me a message. So, um, this person says, I'm a big fan of the podcast and weekly listener. I hear you guys talk about Ned and its benefits. So Ned is the, the hemp oil extract that we, that we were sponsored by. I started using it on my autistic brother. His violent episodes are gone. His OCD is less. He opens his eyes uh, because he said, she says he always closed them uh, from sensory overload. And he actually gets himself ready in the morning and overall level of functioning is improved. His behaviors have been mineral, uh, excuse me, minimal, honestly in shock with his response. How crazy is that? Now well, this is again. This is that's anec- amazing. This is an anecdote. Yeah, but it reminds me of the topic that we just had when we were when we were commenting on the the C- CBD post that you know Steffi Cohen had had posted uh, a, a couple weeks ago when we were talking about that on the show. And you know the thing that I didn't like about it was just like, hey, you know, there's there are people that are the, of course the fitness space. I think is is 
bastardizing it for sure by mm-hmm. you know it's like it's going to build a bunch of muscle by taking fucking CBD mm-hmm. after your workout that and that's a crock of shit yeah there's no evidence but, for that anyway. yeah right but there is there's a lot of people that uh, have found a lot of benefit mm-hmm. uh, from the use of well, hemp oil well here's the evidence right here now they're, they're currently there's a couple studies that show that cannabinoids may have a positive effect on autism um, but they're, they're not conclusive. It's all preliminary. That being said, pharmaceutical companies are investing money in looking at whether or not autism symptoms of autism can be treated or at least ameliorated with uh, cannabinoids, CBD, um, and other cannabinoids. So the fact that pharmaceutical companies are investing money mm-hmm. shows you that they've heard enough anecdote to show that there may be something there. Um, now, right now, all we have to work on is anecdote, but here's the anecdotes that are the most common. Uh, it reduces seizures. That one's actually supported by uh, clinical studies. In fact, that's why uh, CBD is being prescribed um, at the moment. Uh, at the moment, Epidiolex, I believe, is a drug uh, that is uh, prescribed for for certain types of seizures. Um, symptoms of autism. Um, that there's a lot. Uh, people who have autoimmune uh, diseases, Crohn's disease being one of them. There's a lot of anecdote around that. There's a lot of anecdote around um, anxiety. So people are saying that it helps ease their, their symptoms of anxiety. And we, we've talked about how cannabinoids work in the body. And that, and I've also explained how the cannabinoid receptors are so prevalent throughout the whole body that, it, that there, is a, there is a plausible way that cannabinoids could possibly affect so many different things because these cannabinoids are, are found everywhere. Um, so it is very interesting. Now, the cool thing about hemp oil is it's legal and you can try it for yourself. So there, mm-hmm. although there may be limited, uh, you know, uh, clinical evidence, um, if you want to see if it works for yourself, if you don't want to wait another 10, 15 years for all the studies to really come out, you could act, you could do it. You could try it. It's not illegal. Hemp oil, I believe is legal in all 50 States. If I'm not mistaken, you could try it for yourself and then, you know, test it. Tr- try it for a week. Stop taking it for a week. Try it again for a week. See if you can notice the difference. Um, and, you know, like, again, I've, I've been getting lots of messages. The people that I get the most messages from are people that just struggle with, like, anxiety. Yeah. Like, if you're someone who's, like, really anxious all the time or have a trouble settling de- settling down your brain or your your body in general when before you go to bed at night, like, those are probably the most common that I, I hear. Yeah. That, like, wow, it's made a big difference for me. I mean, I've used it with my, my bulldogs, like... Because they have, they're anxious, and it's helped settle them down when we travel and do things. And so there's, I see lots of little applications for it, and I get why someone like uh, Steffi did a a post like that because it, it for sure has gotten to a point where now every fitness influencer is now promoting. Oh, they have CBD, CBD water yeah. for God's sakes. Yeah, and well, they just, do that with anything though, any like protein powder, like you know, they're, they're going to add you know all these like uh, you know like fortifying with all these vitamins, and you know they're going to overdo anything that they find value in uh, to in order to sell a product. And so this is this is the the unintended result of having a product like CBD out there that if you know like specifically used for certain purposes, it has a lot of value, but it can also you know, sound like snake oil. Well, the day. again, if you're going to try something out, make sure it has a lo- full spectrum cannabinoids. It's not just CBD because so far the studies are showing that cannabinoids together are far more effective than when they're isolated. And most products are just, uh, you know, just CBD. Speaking of protein, uh, Justin, I want to tell you guys a little self experiment that I've been doing. So you guys know I was kind of on this uh, this upward trajectory of body weight. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for a little while I was on this. Uh, Dude, I like thick Sal. Yeah. I don't know about you guys. You were, on the, you were on the Justin program. I was on. The, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, was, I, was like, I got like a, a compadre over here. Yeah, yeah, I was on the bulky time. Yeah, it's my buddy bulk. Uh, uh, so now I got a little too far, right? My body weight was creeping above two fifteen, and and I was starting to <laughs> put on some clothes. And I was like, wait, a, there was a picture of me. I don't remember who took of it, but I was sitting down, and I had a little bit of a, a little bit of a so, belly roll. <laughs> It's like, yeah. all right, time to reverse gears. So I cut my calories down uh, by about 500 calories. So I dropped about 500 calories, but I changed my macro po- profile. So I was consuming around 140 to 150 grams of protein, which is a decent amount of protein for a guy who's you know 215. That's not bad at all. But I changed my profile to where I reduced my carbs a little bit, and then I bumped my protein up even higher. So now I'm eating about 200 grams of protein, lower calories. You want to know what's crazy? Stronger, mm. stronger in the gym, lower calories, higher protein, 
and you know, of course, the studies there are studies that show that this can actually happen. But it, it, I understand why protein is so heavily lauded in this fitness space. Like you know, right. we, we call it the magic you know macronutrient. It is part of the process. Oh, it was one of the first. When I think back to my early twenties and and really started diving into nutrition and trying to piece together like how do I build truly build muscle? You know, even after I was lifting weights. Tracking my protein was one of the most significant differences ever. I mean, when I started, then that that's why too. Since day one, we've done this podcast. I've been an advocate for making sure that you get that, even if you have to take a bar or a shake. Although it's ideal to get it through food, I know uh, personally how challenging that was for me to to hit those targets, and I know. That when I made a point like, okay, 200 grams, I'm going to hit 200 grams mm-hmm. every single day consistently, man, I, I would feel the difference and see the difference. Mm-hmm. I would feel a significant difference in my lifts. I would see the muscle come on my body. And then the minute that I stopped paying attention and caring and tracking, uh, I would lose. I would definitely feel myself get weaker in the gym. I would lose some muscle mass. And then when I'd go back to tracking, I'd see, well, sure as shit, I was back down to 130, 120 a day. Now, yep. Now, to be clear, if I go up to 300 grams of protein, I'm not, I'm, I'm most likely not going to see any additional benefits. Right. I went from yeah. 150 to 200, which is still less than one gram of pa- uh, per pound of my body weight. And I'm relatively lean. I wouldn't say I'm super lean, but I'm, I'm relatively lean. Uh, but yeah, protein is like, if you want to lose fat, if you want to build muscle, High protein helps both. It's mm-hmm. like it's a one thing where, you know, carbs and fats can be manipulated or whatever. And some people would say it's you know losing fats easier low carb or whatever. But when it comes to pro, you want to burn body fat. High protein preserves more muscle and has a satiety effect. It does help you eat less. Mm-hmm. When you want to build muscle, high protein accelerates the process. So I can see why it's you know again it's it's considered the the magic macro it's not the magic macronutrient but i can see why it's got that you know right. that, that, hey, that Doug, reputation are, are they going to knock off the contractors back there or what yeah. destruction <laughs> well yeah there was next door yeah oh, did yeah. you have to go fight somebody yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't. Doug, talk the to enforcer. Hey, yeah. I'm just happy they're fixing the bathrooms. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I can't just, complain too yeah. much. Were they nice about it when you went back well, there? No, it was actually next door here. It wasn't the bathroom people. What are they doing next door? They're dragging heavy furniture oh, around. Oh, okay. Sure. Oh, that wasn't even the, the no, guy. No, that's not even them. Oh, well, that's oh our, wow. that, that would be our luck. That's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. And I thought we were supposed to, I thought we agreed that we would send each other the memo when we wear this the shirt here, buddy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You you got got I didn't one? get your memo. Yeah. Yeah. Aren't you guys always paired with Doug? I feel like, yeah, Doug and I are Doug and Sal or Doug and Adam. It's yeah. like, yeah, we're always in somewhat of an alignment he's with Doug. The, he's the apparel whore. He yeah. Just, he yeah. just goes yeah. around everybody. <laughs> no, yeah. it's because- I need more clothing, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. all sponsored by Viore. Duh. So we're all going to wear the same shit. But that's how it goes. Dude, yeah. I was at my cousin's house. It's good stuff. Uh, recently, and we were hanging out, and he bought Lulu uh, athleisure wear pants or whatever. Mm-hmm. So of course, you know, he comes out and he's wearing them. I'm like, "What are you fucking doing, dude?" And he's like, "What? What's yeah. wrong? How dare you spend yeah, that I'm money like, in that you, direction?" I'm like, "Bro, I'm I work with a Viori, who's their competitor. So number one, why are you doing that? Number two, <laughs> Viori's superior. And so no, they're not. I like this one too. They're both good or whatever. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go give you a pair of my pants. Try them on and let me know your honest opinion. So he goes in the bedroom, tries on my Viore, comes out, and he's like, hmm. <laughs> you know, you know, and you know you're wrong, but you don't want to do it. <laughs> and he's like, kind yeah, of there around. might be something to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. anyway, later on, he's ordering, hey, what's your discount code again? Like, yeah, it's like, yeah. Oh, bro. The you, fuck's wrong with you? You wear those ones that you're wearing right now the most, right? Are those yeah. the ones that you wear the most? This is the yeah. easiest sell, dude. Like, all I have to do is like get people to actually wear it. Yeah. Like, yeah in yeah. my family, especially, and my friends. Yeah. It's just like, once, once you put it on, dude, like, it, it, it totally, like, like changes. I don't even well, like to wear jeans anymore, which is yeah. funny because I love jeans. They're comfortable. Well, that was the chat. I squatted in these the other day. When we first partnered with them, which is now, it's been a, two over two years now, uh, and we were courting even before that. The hardest part was they were still on the rock. Like, people hadn't heard. Not enough people had heard of the brand yeah. yet. It was yeah. still still small enough to where it was a, a product that people, oh, I don't know what that is. And you were if you were already attached to something like Lulu, it was a hard sell to get people to go away from that because uh, Lulu's got a, got a great product line for themselves mm, and the sure. material they use is incredible and you know once you find something you really like but once they had been around long enough and got a little more popular and then once people started buying like 
that the reason why we can continue and have a, a partnership with them is because of that, because of the return customers, because mm -hmm. the way our partnership is set up. Oh, is, their, their lifetime value of a customer must be through the roof. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that's what you bank on. You bank and they have stuff where, you know, if anything goes wrong with it, you said they have kind of the Nordstrom type of policy. If you, you, you wear something and you mm -hmm. have a tear or a rip or something like that, you could have had it for six months. You send it back mm -hmm. to them. No questions asked. They'll, they'll send you another pair. And that's because they can stand by the quality of it. It's mm. so, so nice. Oh, dude, I've got to share with you guys a study. I totally just remembered about this last minute. I was going to send this to you, Adam, because um, I know you'd be interested in this. So this this uh, article was published in the uh, Telegraph, which is a website from the UK. But it was based on a study where they were testing mothers and babies and the, their, the way that their brains operate and how, how they sync up. Mm. So a mother's brain and a baby's brain Oftentimes, when the mother's holding the, the the baby, they they can test the brains to so to show that they kind of sync up a little bit. So, like the baby's almost getting the cues from the mom, mm. and the brain starts to sync up and act very similarly. But the studies showed that when the mother was happy, that happens much faster, and it's much more of a solid connection. So, here's what the article says: It says researchers discovered that mothers and babies' brains act together in a mega network where brain waves fall in line allowing for greater connection and empathy. But that level of connectivity varies according to the mother's emotional state. When mothers express more positive emotions, their brain becomes much more strongly connected with their baby's brain. Wow. Whoa. How weird is that? <laughs> How the hell do we track that and find that out? Well, they can, tra they can track brain waves. That, that we've been able to do that for a long time. So what they're looking at is they're looking at the brain waves and they're finding they're seeing that the brain waves start the to same sync pattern. Up. Yes. Now, how common is that? I mean, is it like for all of us right now to be talking? Do we start to get into it because we're having a conversation together? Do our brain do they start to get on the same path? Or? I would surmise that some some of that happens, right? Like yeah. you, you're talking to someone and you feel their vibe, their energy. You just so totally that, sync up with yeah. Them so that starts flow state. To, yeah, and, and I, I feel have, like the stronger that happens, the more you can connect with someone, the better your chemistry. That is makes sense. That makes sense that that would be the definition of like what what group flow is. What's probably happening? Yeah. Right? When yeah. you think of a SEAL team when they're all working together, there's no in verbal, the same brain state. Yeah, as they get in the same state where they're mm -hmm. almost as one. But well, I think at, at some point they're going to find an artificial way to you know sync more people up together. I'm sure of it. Oh, well, they, I mean, that's what weird. things like like totally ha weird. Halo and those things are supposed to do for the athletes, right? That's why they practice with those those uh, head uh, headsets on, like the Warriors. They use they use Halo right before uh, or wh why they practice. And I think the idea of that is to try and get everybody on the same brain length, which is only going to promote better passing and moving the ball and seeing the court better. I, I would assume that what helps that is the more you work with someone and the more you practice you know, being synced up together, the more you practice being in the same wavelength, the, the, the more you practice focusing on things the same way, the easier that that starts to happen. Because then yeah. you see that person, you have a history of syncing right. up. Yeah, it's like repetitions then creates a way for it to like get way down in there into the subconscious almost, where it's like you don't think about it, that you just react because like you just know, you know, where to go. What is it. subconscious? I mean, you're not, yeah. You know, yeah. But to, to what's crazy to me is the studies they have on this with mothers, and babies and you know speaking as a man you know we will never ha understand what that that kind of connection feels like because you know like, like Katrina right she carried Max for you know, nine months she grew she was everywhere sleep bathroom car everywhere she's not just with this you know baby she's growing this baby yeah that's gotta that's gotta create a bond that none of us, I don't think, well, I know, I, it's part of their body, yeah, you know, at yeah, the end and, of the day. And not to downplay the, the love and connection a father has for their kids. I love my kids to death and I feel very connected to them. <clears throat> but that's got to be something that uh, there's there's got to be something special or different about that that I don't think we'll ever be able to experience. Maybe in the future when we. I'm sure they'll create. Well, we artificial. start out with the tadpoles that yeah. are alive. <laughs> You're connected to the sperms. Yeah, yeah. Their <laughs> eggs aren't alive yet, so you know we got that going for us. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Hey, speaking of kids, I thought you told me the other day that you had to borrow some money from your kids. <laughs> Oh, things are getting rough, <laughs> huh? <laughs> Tough yeah, time. it would seem that way, right? Doug, Doug, we could give Justin a raise now. I think he's been no, working hard enough. I mean, how often do you have cash on hand, like for whatever? I just thought it was hilarious because uh, I brought that up because we, 
you know, there's certain things like at school they need, you know, to, to hand in some cash for certain projects or certain things that they need for the teacher. And like Courtney's like, you have cash? I'm like, I don't have cash. You have cash? And then we, at the end of the day, we had to like go ask, you know, our youngest. We had to ask Everett. We're like, hey, I know you have some cash because you just had like his tooth out from the tooth fairy <laughs> that we just paid him. And we're just like, we'll totally pay you back. You know, and then he got all like, you know, you guys, I'm like, please, please pay me back. Like, I'm <laughs> like, and, like, make sure like I get it back. And we're just like, yeah, we got it. Don't like, worry I don't about have to it. kick your ass. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I messed up with the tooth oh. fairy with, uh, with my daughter. Cause she, same reason I never have cash on me. Right. So her tooth comes out. It's like, you know, right before bed or whatever. I'm like, oh, I don't want to have to give her like a book or something. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> Here's a pencil. Yeah, hella yeah. pissed. Well, ah! well, no, I don't want, I'm like, I don't want to have to go to the freaking you know, ATM and all that stuff. All I had was a 20. That's way too much for a tooth. Oh, yeah. Way you too much. You can't justify that. But I was, my laziness was more powerful than, than the, the rationale. <laughs> so I gave her a 20, right? Now every goddamn tooth she loses yeah. is a $20 bill. You know, I can't go down. Yeah, yeah. No, Once you give them a 20, it's like, you know, <laughs> right, why did I get a five this time? Did I do something wrong? Yeah, it just felt wrong, though. I'm like, like taking two dollars, you know, and you got you guy. have to pay him back, right? If you don't, if you don't pay him back, that's like forever no, scar. Kid. That's all he thinks about, you know. Like yeah. they, they think in in point A and point B, like there's two things. Like it, it's just like if you don't do it, there's no other factors involved. Like you didn't give me the money, yeah. you know. Like I, that's my money. How much too. did he give you? Two bucks. Oh, it was two dollars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but that's interest. like all his money. I was gonna say yeah. you could trick him a little bit. Like if he gave you a five, you can give him like three ones. Be like, I'm giving you more. <laughs> Look at there's more of these than the one you gave. This me. is a math lesson you're learning. Make a little little profit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Then he really hates you when he can finally do math later on. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. I said that to my siblings. They're like, Oh, you have a quarter? I'll give you five of these pennies for yeah. that quarter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Dude, so it's been raining a lot. Like, did you guys see? Uh, the, there's this this brand. There's this. Uh, this brewery that's up in Northern California that's actually making fun of the whole like blackout thing with PG and E. I thought it was like hilarious. And oh brilliant. wow, what are they doing? So they they branded like the can, so it looks just like it's like a PG and E label, and they called it Mandatory Blackout. That's the name of the beer. Oh wow, so you clever. Can, yeah, so you could like pop one off when when you know the the power's out. Make pull a that party up, out I want to see that. I pull that up. I, I just I, was, I just appreciate clever marketing and branding. No, totally. Like you saw that with uh, the whole like storm area fifty one yeah, with yeah, the, yeah. the beer cans Dude, and all beer, that. Hey, I don't know why nobody else does this, or or maybe the beer companies just do such a good job of paying these guys and girls, but the people that run the the advertising in in beer companies. I think are they on, get it. They're on like a whole other level compared to like everybody. Of course, they always have been that way. Of course. When yeah. you think those are the ones you look forward to at Super Bowl or anything else, yeah. like it's like what are the beer? Oh, oh wow, like? they, they even use pg and branding. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So they got a bunch of backlash, I guess, because of course, like pg and employees, I'm sure were just like yeah, whatever, because yeah. they were like there was another one that was way more aggressive. It was like basically it was like fuck pg and or yeah. something, and then you're just like okay, that's hey hey, that wasn't very clever. What's yeah. the what's the brand, uh, Doug? It, it's a Imperial. So what's the brand of the beer? Barrel Brothers. Imperial Brothers. No, Barrel. No, Barrel. Oh, oh, Barrel Brothers, and it's where it's it's where at. Northern California. Yeah, it's up in Northern yeah. California. Sounds Probably like, Sonoma. I area. mean, it sounds like a great idea. Everybody loses their power. Your your security is down. Let's all get yeah, drunk. Yeah, let's make a party about yeah. it. Yeah. Let's all get drunk. That what what could possibly go what wrong? What could go wrong? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, Sonoma County. Yeah, oh. no potential anarchy and apocalyptic oh, this things. Is, this is Danny's area. We should have Danny go get a go, go have one. Did you guys? Are you guys familiar with what happened? I don't remember what year. It was in the 70s. Maybe Doug can look this up. The, are we the, familiar the, with the, that? The, no, I'm not. Are you guys 70s? familiar with the 70s? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was born in 80. That was a good. It was a good good decade. No, the the there was a blackout in New York City, I think it was, in the 70s. Doug um, can remember this. Yeah, I remember that. Doug was in college at this time. <laughs> <laughs> Driving his Model T Ford. That's, that's when his first grandkid was born. <laughs> <laughs> his phonograph. Yeah. <laughs> Doug and Moses were friends back in the day, by the way. No, so uh, uh, there was a blackout in New York City. I don't remember how long it lasted, but it caused major anarchy. Like lights went out and then crime went through the roof. And really? Yes, it was the New York City blackout in 1977. It was there was just looting. everybody looting everybody's stuff. Oh, and dude! How stores. long did it last? Was it like a long blackout? Um, I mean, it had to been for people to start looting and going crazy. Let's see. Uh, let me see. It was the summer March. Nine thirty p.m. What did it say? Twenty four hour, a twenty five hour outage. Oh wow! Yes. See, that's crazy. It was less than it was a day, bro. That's insane. See that that 
I, I think like this, this is what I was worried about. Like with the whole, like, man, like we know ahead of time when the blackouts are going to occur too. Yeah. So it's like, you know, if you're this like savvy crime guy, you know, like I'm, that's the perfect time to do it. Yeah. Well, to be fair, uh, New York city in the seventies had terrible, terrible crime. Yeah. It was not a great place uh, to be. Yeah, they really cleaned it up. They did. They got to clean it up aggressively. Is actually what happened. Yeah, it wasn't. Which, there was a little controversy around that, but there was. Uh, but yeah, it was not a, a very safe, uh, a safe place in the seventies. So the lights went out for twenty five hours, and it went crazy. Yeah. It went absolutely nuts. Anyway, who's that guy in the forum people were posting about that you guys said is on a show or something on Silicon Valley? Oh, oh, the, uh, uh, yeah. I don't watch. The, yeah, the that's show. right. Uh, God, what is his name? Can you pull that up, Doug? I totally forgot his name. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Indian guy from so from he's the Pakistani, show. but yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, Kumail, Kumail Nanjiani. Thank you. Yeah, Nanjiani. he's a stand-up comedian too. Uh, but yeah, he got he's, jacked. Like he <laughs> apparently, like he got hired on for this uh, uh, Marvel series too, and so he obviously like needed to play the part of a superhero, so needed to put on some muscle mass and went through this aggressive training program. I think even Jocko and his team were part of his training. So I I, I don't know what he looked like before. I, all I saw on the forum was a picture of him after, and he did look pretty fit. Is that was that a radical transformation? He was pretty radical. He was pretty radical. Oh, I mean, yeah. he was yeah he he didn't like have any visible muscle definition or anything. No, like for yeah, and I've I've seen him on Silicon Valley, and I've seen a couple of his stand-ups, and he didn't look anything like. Did that. they say how long it took for him to get there? Because there's like a big deal about it. Everybody I haven't. Re- I mean, everybody's. I've had a, I've had a ton of DMs yeah. over it, and people asking if he's on steroids, just that. And it's such a funny question to me when people, first of all, even care about that because it's like whatever. I, I I actually think he'd be a fool not to take steroids, right? Uh, you're a you're a comedian, right? You your your big hit is I think Silicon Valley is probably his biggest hit show, right? Yeah. And then you get signed with Marvel, probably the biggest contract of his fucking life. Uh, and part of the deal is you need to be jacked going into it. Um, and you have X amount of months, maybe at most. I doubt they give him years to plan yeah. for that. You have I'm going to guess like six months, but probably more. Right. I mean, uh, the stuff that we know about testosterone and, and how you can use it, uh, I mean, I and I'm in his place, I go higher you know, two, two or three of the best people in the field of nutritionists. And yeah, I'm yeah, for go sure. Go to some hormone, you know, yeah. lab or whatever. Yeah. Doug, if you could pull up his picture, because from what I recall, he did look fit, but it didn't look like he was. No, he was not. He was never fit. No, no, no. What I mean is the after. Oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. what I've been. He didn't tell- look like no, insane. No, no, What I've been telling people is. No, it's, it's very. Uh, he has an obtainable look naturally, but I oh, doubt. there he is. But I doubt he did. I'm sure he used anabolics to get there. Well, here's the thing, though. Think. Look, let, let's pause. For, he but does. He looks pretty impressive. He looks pretty impressive, but he doesn't look like I wouldn't look at that. I wouldn't if I didn't know any better and I just saw him, I think he was just a committed fitness enthusiast. But we also need to be fair. Here's a guy who his job is to look fit for a role. Six months, imagine. Six months, he's got tons of money. He's got somebody making his meals for him. All he's doing is training and getting good sleep. You can make a radical change in six months yeah, if you don't do, have to. You can put a big debt. If you don't do have it. to worry about anything else, like you don't have to worry about work, uh, uh, the work. Oh, you know, was, the work. that was me. I mean, I I wasn't working really, and you know, my whole from fat to fit to competitive to, to competing to professional journey was I was dedicated to that. It was there was not much other things on my plate at that time, and you absolutely can make a, a radical change in in that amount of time. Yeah, because especially if you went from like not working out. Yeah. To all of a sudden, you or, or you, you know, a terrible diet and not exercising, and then yeah. you and then you swing the other direction. And so I, I I got a lot of questions around whether I think he's he's natural or not. And you know I, I say that his he the, could be natural. Yeah, the look he has is obtainable naturally. I think totally. you, I think you could look that way naturally. One hundred percent. There's guys that uh, look even more impressive that are natural uh, than what he is. But do I think he has? Probably not. Like I mean. Yeah. I wouldn't if I if I was in his shoes and I had to get ready for if Marvel called me today and said, "Yo, Adam, you got six months to yeah. look the most impressive." Here's you five can. million dollars. But, yeah, it's funny because you see who's giving him the most hate right now. It's Who? the other comedians. 
Oh, really? And like, of course, you know, like it, uh, it's just like, oh, all of a sudden on the sauce, you know, I mean, that's like, that's almost the button that everybody just hacks right away. Like, oh, oh, I, I know. I saw Shabby throw something up on it. Yeah, he's thrown some shit. It might be, yeah. it, it might actually, you know, it's funny. Comedians, com- being a comedian is the only profession I can think about where getting fit might actually hurt you. Right. Like, like if you're a fit, good looking yeah. person on stage, it's harder to it be could, funny. It could, yeah. Unless you, yeah. If, that's the thing. If that's part of the act, you know, a lot of times too, like some comedians have lost a lot of weight and then it didn't get received quite the yeah. same way well jo- jonah hill way funnier fat than when he's lean <laughs> yeah. yeah it's just true I mean, i'll agree with that too and that's, I think he's that's a great the unfortunate actor. part yeah. yeah he's like more lovable like, hey. speaking of fit comedians uh i i you know what and it, i'm almost a little embarrassed to admit this but i think that one of the best shows on television right now is the marvelous miss mazel Oh yeah, I, I just got started. I just started third, that the third, too. The third season just came, uh, it, and we it's great. We binged it right. Out. It's so fucking good. Really, it's it's, it's funny as shit. Uh, the, the it's a period piece, so you could really yes. see, like you know, in the fifties. They did a really what an original job. what an original story to tell. Show me another movie, or you know, it's, we're we're at a point now where you know, t- television and movies have been around so long. It's hard to find original original content almost everything's remade of something else yeah show me a show that depicts the the 50s like this and and from this perspective it's a it's a woman who gets cheated on by her her husband that then drives her to pursue her her kind of career dreams which is stand up comedy as a female in, in the, the 50s in the 50s oh, yeah. leaves Grown her up from a well off you know family. a rich family right and she goes so like such an original plot and then the characters that they pick in the show are just fucking right. phenomenal you brought so, it up enough times i'll check it out i can't believe yeah. you you guys haven't watched it's really it good, it's dude. really really good no i'm looking for a show too i like i'm watching the mandalorian uh with the kids yeah. but i haven't seen uh, I'll, I'll check that it's out. i i i say it's and it's a um a great both you know, male or female, I think it's great, but it's definitely they they depict a lot of powerful uh, female roles in it, really fucking well. In a time when that was not very popular, oh, cool. And so I think they do an incredible job, and it's hilarious and it's smart. Like it's a, a it great gives show. you a little bit of history of stand up comedy too, yeah, which is cool. Yeah, yeah that, no, it's that just was all at the beginning of it all. Uh, it's it's for sure up there with one of, if not my favorite show. That's uh, on it's on Amazon, so you can stream it on there if you have Prime. So you you got to watch you got, you and Jessica will like it. First question is from Tyler Hagen Fit. Is progressive overload as important for hypertrophy or is stressing the muscle as hard as you can each workout sufficient? All right. So before I answer this, uh, I, let's, let's talk about what progressive overload means for the listeners who might not be familiar with that term. Essentially what that means is adding more weight or adding more exercises or more reps. Gradually. Essentially doing more as you progress in your workout. So is that important for, and hypertrophy means building muscle. Is it important that you eventually progress to where you could do more exercises, more reps, or lift more weight um, in order to build muscle? Yes, it's very important. That being said, don't take that to being the only thing you need to do to build muscle because I've had many occasions with clients where I reduced their volume of working out. I've reduced... (laughs) the amount of reps or exercises, and then they built muscle. So progressive overload is an important thing to, uh, to to factor in, but it can be overdone. And when it's overdone, it actually will result in reduced or less uh, progress. Now, I want to I want to challenge that a little bit, not because I disagree, but I, I think that that's le- less often the case. Um, m- more people, I think, don't, progressively overload consistently enough to see progress week over week, month over month, year over year uh, correctly or in, uh, consistently in order to reap the benefits. It's more rare to get the case that you're talking about, which does happen, uh, where and that's that typically falls in the same category as the people that we talk about that abuse the protein, that are the hardcore people that never take days off, the, mm-hmm. the fitness fanatics. So if you're listening and you're part of the fitness community, I agree with what you're saying, and I and I do think that the, the, those people I have I too have seen that and myself reap the benefits of going from training six seven days a week, reducing the volume tremendously, and I saw huge benefits from it. But I think that the average person and I and I like to talk about 
uh, progressive overload or volume in general to clients. Like, so the way I kind of talk about uh, progressive overload is in relation to how I talk about uh, volume in general to, to clients. Now, what I have found from being the guy who tracks all the time for a long time is that we have this tendency to uh, always kind of find homeostasis and even with our like our training. So like we'll have like this great week or two or even three weeks in a row of like consistently training a little harder and kind of pushing the weight up. And then we have a, a rough week. We're busy. Something happens. And you still get to the gym and you think you're doing well, but what you didn't realize was just that little bit of being off that week, you, you, you stopped a set early, you, you didn't quite lift as much weight, and the volume kind of comes back down. And a lot of times this is the cause of people's plateaus and me teaching somebody to track their volume and actually pay attention, which is sets times reps times weight gives you total volume. And then tell them like, listen, your goal week over week when we're training is to make sure you at least hit your total volume for that workout compared to the one the week before or slightly increase that just a little. And it doesn't take much, just that little bit of increase week over week. This is what I had to do when I was competing because when I was competing, everything was on on the clock. Uh, there was I can't have a week of setback. I've got to be making progress. If I'm going to make my way up the amateur ladder and into the pros, I've got to be progressing and improving all the time. And so there was not room for taking 10 steps back or getting lazy for a week or two or falling off consistency. So I was diligently tracking and volume was one of the, the number one things that guided me through my progress during that journey. And that's what I found was this natural inconsistency that most people fall into. Well, well there's, there's something I want to add to that. Two things. One, uh, one of the problems with understanding this is people think that progressive overload is consistent and linear. It's not. Uh, if you track your progress, you don't progress every single week. Your body doesn't do that. It just doesn't work that no, way. No, but you can you can progressively overload without just strength, right? So it's not... You, you, you can, but it's there are going to be weeks where whatever reason, lack of sleep, uh, you've pushed your body hard the previous yeah, you week. dips. And not only that, but the formula that, you, that you're talking about, which is a common formula that we use, and it has value, you know, sets times uh, reps times weight, there's, a, there's a, uh, a fault with it in the sense that Lightweight, high reps disproportionately calculates volume over heavyweight and low reps. So in other words, in order to equate the volume of 10 sets of squats at 100 pounds with 10 reps, or let's just forget the sets for a sec second, let's say they're equal, 10 reps at 100 pounds, that means you have to squat 1,000 pounds once. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't equate, doesn't work that way. So when you're cycling your reps, as we recommend, Sometimes it looks like you're doing less volume, but that's not because you're doing less volume. It's because the formula isn't perfect. So if you do, like, if you do, again, if I, if I take somebody who could do 10 reps with 100 pounds on a squat and I put 200 pounds on the bar, they might be able to only do four reps. The volume looks like it went way down, but the intensity is part of the, fa part of the formula that doesn't often get factored in. And when you go heavy, it looks like you're doing way less volume but it does place uh, a pretty high demand and stress well, on Well, I think the body. I think that's uh, again why I I think it is it's not flawless, nothing is, right? And, sure. there, and there's such an individual variance in everybody and anything we talk about, right? There's too many things that are that are you have to take into consideration. But following something like this and then understanding the benefits like you're saying of intensity, you know, if I'm tracking volume and I'm just my goal is to add a little and I'm talking little, start small, which is why MAPS Anabolic is where we we push everyone to start, which is a two to three day a week type of a program, which gives me lots of room to scale scale up and progressively overload with other days and longer uh, workouts, whatever in the future. So I, I think that you slowly overloading volume by adding a tiny bit week over week and then manipulating intensity based off of the points that you're making right now. So if I had a really rough rest i didn't i didn't sleep very well that day but i i'm consistent with my training and, I, and i'm competing so i don't i'm not missing very much at all so that's the day where i'm going to hit my volume target but i'm going to back off the intensity i'm not going to do the single rep for a thousand pounds i'm going to do lightweight get a pump get the volume up there so i keep my volume i keep my body used to 
training that much so that we so atrophy doesn't set in at all or start to set in. So I want to keep the volume up there, but I back off the intensity because I know that my body is stressed today or I didn't get adequate rest or my nutrition isn't where it's supposed to be. And then the next day when I'm feeling great or two, three days later of good, consistent sleep and good food. Now, when I go back and I hit that leg day again, this time, now the intensity goes up. That's why I think this is a good concept and principle to understand, but I don't think it's a good idea to take it to heart because there's a lot of other factors that can determine, you know, whether or not you're going to build muscle or not. And if you take this to heart, um, it's not going to always lead you in the right direction, well, but it's something you, it that you, you need to consider. It can get you hurt. It can get mm-hmm. you hurt. If all, you're, if all you're concerned about is progressively overloading, adding weight, adding weight, adding weight. Or and, overtrain. And exactly. And you're not paying attention to your stress, your sleep, your nutrition, then you absolutely, this could head down a, a bad path, right? That's, well, this has always been the criticism I've had of a lot of these apps that track, you know, that that progress and that gets you so fixated on, um, you know, exactly, you know, the numbers moving forward or not. And so it is, there, there are so many other variables that interrupt that process that you have to account for, but it is a good baseline, I think. I think it's something that, like, it's, it, I want to achieve this and, and to be able to then keep perpetuating forward, you know, this is a measure I can look into it, it you know it reminds me of how i feel about tracking nutrition i mean the goal is not to it you, it's not like something you should do for the rest of your life but when i think about some uh foundational principles that i think everybody should go through if you really want to learn about building muscle uh tracking volume and and understanding progressive overload is by far one of the core principles in my opinion does that mean that you you should you should live and die by that principle absolutely not there's too many other variables that come into play that i agree with you guys but I, when i think of some some of the most pivotal things in in my fitness journey personally and with clients when i taught this principle and they they understood it it really opened up their eyes to why probably they were stuck in a lot of plateaus because like i said mm. people that aren't tracking aren't paying attention to it it's really amazing how your body just kind of naturally goes to the this place where you feel comfortable you might have one or two days where you really stretch yourself volume wise and maybe intensity wise and then you kind of naturally back off and then when you when you pull back and you look at the entire month you go, oh shit! I pretty much average the same, you know, every single week, yeah, week the over week. Job is to yeah. make things more efficient. For it, it's one of the tools, and again, you can actually reduce your volume, reduce the weight, uh, reduce the sets, and then all of a sudden uh, see your body progress. So it's not a rule; it's just something to look at and consider. And of course, at the end of the day, you know, the answer that we always say is. You know, it uh, it depends. It, it depends, depends on a lot of different things. But it, I, I, I want to point out to the last part of this, which is or stressing the muscle as hard as you can in each workout sufficient. That's a terrible idea. Totally. Yeah. So I, we didn't really address yeah, that. We, we were kind of you know debating back and forth on the, the importance. No, of- the progress can be can be incremental. It can be tiny. You know, let's if I did ten reps last week with a weight for bench press. In fact, I recommend it to be incremental. If I did 10 reps last week and then this week I did 11 reps, I'm probably better off just doing one extra rep than pushing to see if I could do another two or three reps. The more incremental I make my progress, the more consistent my progress will be week over week. This is just something I've noticed for myself. If I'm stronger today than I was last week, rather than pushing to see how much stronger I am, I'm just going to be up five pounds or, or a rep. And then next week we'll see what happens. And what I found when I have that approach is that I progress for longer and more consistently. And I end up having greater overall progress versus pushing the limit and saying just how far I can go every single time I work out. It's a great way to hit a plateau. Yeah, I think you. I think we should spend most of our time optimizing and then every once in a while you're stretching yourself outside of that. And so doing it every single workout is an awful idea. I just... That is not. It's not only not. Is it? It's not, like beginner mistake. Number it one. is a big mistake. It's a big and it's uh, and it's part of the culture that I don't like. You know that this the beast mode all out training to failure, having a, a, a partner squat or uh, spot you. Come on, push one more, one more. You got one more. You do it, training like that uh, every workout uh, is stupid. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. it's 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 and the only people that that get like truly get away with it are the people that are hopped up on all kinds of anabolics, mm-hmm. and so they get away with it. And it's still even for them. It's not the most optimal way. They would do better if they didn't do it. Right. Next question is from that fly guy. They say if you're tall, you are at a natural disadvantage for squats. Can you discuss different methods to progress and increase range of motion? Will I hit a point where I can't advance any further doing high bar 
back squats. All right, so I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something, and then I want you to, to answer this, Adam, because I feel like you have the best experience being a very tall guy who's progressed to squat from terrible to <clears throat> phenomenal in a very short period of time. But, but before, I, before you do that, you know, here's the, here's the reason why tall people uh, have been say, said to have disadvantages when it comes to certain exercises. What you're dealing with are levers. And the longer the lever is, the more uh, more force needs to be put on that lever to get it to lift the same amount of weight. So think about it this way. If I grab a, a shovel with a very, very long handle and I grab the very end of the handle and try and lift the shovel off the ground, okay. it's going to be much more difficult than if I grab the handle closer to where the weight of the shovel is. A lot more gravitational forces that are working against you. It's just leverage. It's just the way leverage uh, works. So when you're tall... You have longer levers. Now, that being said, tall people can oftentimes make up for it by having bigger muscles. Tall people have bigger muscles typically because they're taller. So when you look at the records in strength, in general strength, look at strong men, they tend to be big dudes. They tend to be tall dudes. They're mm -hmm. not typically short people. So, yes, there's that leverage advantage. But it doesn't. Uh, but it's not the advantage that everybody says it is because the big people typically, maybe not on a pound for pound basis, but generally overall wise, can tend to have higher potentials uh, for strength. Yes and no. I, I um, for sure, and I think the the examples you have of that are more uh, deadlifting. Like it's a, it's an advantageous to have long limbs when you're pulling. When you're pulling something, that the the leverage is in your is in your favor. Uh, because of that, uh, if you think of how a deadlift works, uh, having long arms, yeah, is, long arms is specific. it's a shorter range of motion. Yeah, it's a shorter range of motion that I have to lift the the bar off the ground. And plus, again, also physics, understanding that if I have this long lever, that if my uh, you think of where the hips are at to where my arms go, that having that to pull something up is is advantageous. Mm. So having long limbs for a deadlift is actually, which, which is why I can deadlift significantly more than what I can I can squat. So I, I, I don't think that we we see the the greatest squatters uh, with that are tall. I don't think that's but true. But they're also not the shortest, is my point. Yeah, maybe not the... the, the, yeah. the that's what I mean, because taller people have bigger muscles. So if you go to the extremes, it makes perfect sense. You know, you're not going to get a seven-foot basketball player and have them squat uh, very effectively <clears throat> but, it, but because of the long levers. But it doesn't go all the way down to like, okay, fine. Yeah, five, the 5'5 five, five guy is not squatting the most yeah, amount of yeah, exactly. yeah, and even the strongman you, you brought up, like, too, you, you always see their feats being, like, so much more substantial, like, geared towards the deadlift, uh, for mm. instance, and carrying things versus the actual squat mechanics. Yeah. But they are still putting up quite, uh, you know, impressive numbers squat-wise. It does. I, you know, and the things that have helped me with this is that uh, it's – how I've reframed almost everything in my life. I, I look at adversity and challenge and uh, I, I've tried to look at that instead of poor me or that sucks or make excuses and, oh, cool, this is an area that I can work hard at and try and improve. And uh, even though when people look at my squad on my Instagram, I get all the trolls and it's not impressive and it's like whatever. To me, it's uh, it's very impressive to what, what I've accomplished. I was... Uh, I was a terrible uh, back squatter. Uh, I had a, a chronic low back pain. I had bursitis in my hips. I could barely break uh, 90 degrees when I squat. Um, and, you know, three plates was heavy for me. So for me to be able to get to a place now where I can uh, sit in a, a deep, deep squat and uh, my squat mechanics uh, feel really good and uh, my hip pain and my bursitis is gone, my low back pain is gone. Um, and I'm pretty strong, uh, relatively strong uh, at squatting. Uh, that to me is uh, means everything. But it's taken, you know, I, you know, Sal alluded to it being a, a short while. It's felt like a long time for me. It's uh, been uh, a lot of work. You know, I I I constantly was focused on this. So when and when you're tall, uh, there's common areas that I think that that you are challenged in. And one of those, I, I think, the number one in my opinion, and I did a YouTube video on this recently, is the the combat stretch and, and ankle mobility. Yeah, because because the levers are so long, you need probably more ankle mobility than somebody who's short. For sure, I my I my knees need to be able to travel over my toes a lot further than what Justin's knees have to go over his mm -hmm. toes, because my shins are so long. And in order to get my ass 
all the way to the ground. I've got to have that mobility in my ankles to allow the knee. And that was the number one limiting factor for me. As soon as I would get a little bit lower than 90, I would hit that end range of motion for my my ankle mobility, and then the breakdown in the squat would happen. Mm-hmm. You know, And then I would feel the pain in my hips and in my low back. So ankle mobility first was was everything was addressing that. And then the next thing after that was uh, working on my hip mobility, uh, the ability for me to, to open up my hips and drop that deep. I was just unfamiliar familiar territory uh, for me, and uh, I had to put a lot of work on uh, internal rotation and external rotation of my hips, which is basically living in the, the 90-90 and all the transitions in that. So basically focusing on uh, 90-90 and the combat stretch, those two mobility drills and doing them, I'm talking two, three times a day, every day. And that sounds like a lot, but I'm not spending 20, 30 minutes. I, anytime I have an opportunity to jump down on the carpet and get into a 90-90 position, I would. Anytime that I could get down into the combat stretch, and do, I would. And it, I would spend two to three minutes doing this to improve that just and constantly and what's awesome now and and why i i i do like to share this because it, it was so, so life-changing for me when we talk about the low back pain and hip pain that i had is it's cool that i i don't have to put that work in anymore mm-hmm. like it's super all i have to do now is do things that promote that mobility which is squatting really deep so now when I when I get ready, all the work and effort that I used to have to put into the 90-90 and the, the combat stretch, I can get now right down into that deep, really mm-hmm. deep position mm-hmm. and I can connect to my feet, connect to my hips and actually just kind of get and, and intensify that position real quick for a minute before I get into my squats and I'm ready to roll. Oh yeah, if you want to get good at, uh, at the best exercises, MAPS Prime Pro is your program, 100%, because that's what it's design for you go through the different joints work on your areas of mobility and then watch yourself improve that being said there's going to be exercises that you're going to be better at naturally and there's gonna be exercises that you're not going to be as good at naturally uh regardless of how much mobility work for example adam does on a squat he's naturally built to deadlift so he's probably always going to be a much you, better deadlift. You say this a lot, Sal, that I think it's it's important that everybody pay attention to this and and you know, you are. You're going to find areas that you're you're not good at, but th- that's where the most room for improvement is. Totally. So and, and we get asked carry over. We just too. got asked a question recently like, you know, how do you guys stay motivated with training and exercise after 20 years of doing it? Well, part of the way that I stay motivated is finding the areas and aspects of my training that I suck at mm-hmm. and putting a lot of energy and focus into it. Mm-hmm. It's it's the reason why it's fun is not because I'm good and impressive. I can't post any cool Instagram posts or I don't look impressive in the gym next to everybody else. But what's what's fun and interesting for me is that there's lots of room for improvement. And when you've been training for as long as we have, it's hard to get those those leaps and yeah. bounds still. I mean, this question to me, there's no real secret hacks to that. I mean, it's it really the same rules apply to anybody, like in terms of like where you're stable and where you, you know, lack mobility. That's what you need to address. And it might take you a bit longer based off of, you know, the levers and the mechanics you're dealing with, but it's worth it. So like going through that process is, you know, may seem like it's daunting and it may take you a bit longer than somebody else that it just comes more naturally towards but you just get so much more payout when it is more difficult yeah the progress of going from not being able to do something well to being able to do something well is phenomenal yes but then the progress from now that you could do something well you can unlock all of its potential value so if we're talking about an exercise like a squat the potential value of a squat is tremendous it's one of the best possible exercises that most people can do so to get yourself from not squatting well to being able to squat well, amazing, amazing progress. You get great results. But now that you could do it well, now you can unlock the potential of one of the most powerful, effective exercises uh, in resistance training known to man. And this is true from for other very effective exercises that we've talked about on the podcast. So if you find yourself not being able to do some of them, get to the point where you can do them because then when you can do them, Boy, the the results are phenomenal, and that and that's part. The major process is getting there, and uh, I, I think this this message gets uh, misunderstood sometime on our show because you know we've got people that oh they hear us talking about deep squatting, and then they just go out there and they start deep squatting because you hear us talk about the benefits of that, and they get hurt. Yeah, and then <laughs> you get hurt, or it bothers your low back, or whatever, and it's like no. 
the, the idea is that you put in all the work so you can get to that play. And that is, you know, that's the hard shit. That's the shit that it's, that's the practice, right? That's the, the stuff that is, is boring and, yeah. and laborious, right? To do. And you, you've got to do those things to get to the place to where you can. But when you do, and then, you, and, and like Sal said, man, man it, the, what it unlocks for you, it, it, it's changed my life. Like a, for anybody who suffers from uh, bursitis and know what that feels like, it's a fucking, it's like someone's sticking a knife in your in your joint. It's an awful feeling. Bro, feel. it's like a video game when you're playing and then you have those characters that you can't use, but then you unlock them and then all of a sudden you got, you oh, know, yeah. the wizard or whatever. <laughs> like, you know, it's like- I was thinking of a voodoo doll that you're just like stabbing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's yeah. what it feels like when you when you have something like that and, uh, and me for having chronic low back pain- uh, to eliminate those things uh, because I put the work in. Yeah, it was a year and a half or so of a lot of mobility drills yeah, and work. But now it's gone. It. Yeah, but now it's gone completely. You don't have to live with it anymore. Yeah, and and all I now all I need to do is to is to keep squatting deep, and I know that I'll, I'll mm. keep that healthy. So, next question is from Eugene Cavanaugh. I'm addicted to the gym and go six times per week, even when I'm hurt. Is this good or bad? Yeah, well, obviously not good. Um, <laughs> not a good thing. You know, exercise addiction is like any other addiction. It uh, it it starts to decrease your quality of life. It reduces the uh, your ability to have good relationships with the people around you. The obvious, it can injure your body physiologically. You can cause problems for yourself. Probably, if you're that addicted to the gym, it probably carries over to the way you eat um, and the way you supplement. Um, exercise, like, okay, here's the thing. There are a lot of things that we can do in the world that have a potential to be phenomenal for us. And then they also have the potential to be bad. Uh, opiates, uh, opiates have amazing potential for alleviating pain when people really need it. They also have a potential to become extremely addictive. Gambling, sex, you know, we can talk about food. You look at food, food can nourish your body and make you healthy, or you can kill yourself, uh, by being addicted to food. Exercise is no different. This is a very difficult one uh, to conquer, though, because the belief is, the common belief is that exercise is good and more exercise yeah, is better. It's always good. And it's always good. And, you know, it's like work. Like, this is why work addiction is so difficult to beat. It's like, but I'm working. I'm not being yeah. lazy. I'm not doing anything. I'm productive. Yes. It's, it's still can harm you. Now, how do you, now here's, here's the big question. Here's the real question. How do you reverse out of this? Boy, is that hard. Boy, is that hard. Now, First off, the only way, in my opinion, that you can address this kind of an issue is to figure out the root reason of uh, why mm. you're addicted to the gym. Yeah. What is what are you you medicating with fitness? Like why are you using the gym to medicate yourself? What is it that you're hiding from, running from, or numbing with working out? Mm. Are you is it your your relationship at home? Is it that you hate everything else? You hate your job? Is it that you feel depressed if you're not exercising or do, maybe you have body image issues to where if you're not working out, you're just focusing on how much you hate the way you look? If you don't find that root cause, what will end up happening is you'll stop working out or reduce your exercise and you will find another way to medicate yourself and it may be, it may be something else that's, that, that's going to also harm you. So really got to find that root. I, you went right where I was going to go, which you know we, were, we started this episode off about talking about self-awareness and- you know, here's here's an exercise that you can do for yourself uh, around self awareness that I think would really help, and that is, you know, tell yourself uh, you're going to miss the gym today or for this week, uh. and the first thoughts that come into your head and fears that come into mm -hmm. your head if you do that is is the is the secret to. Right. What Sal is alluding to yeah, right what now. What are you struggling with? Yeah, now? if, if is you it a body thing. Yeah, if you, you start getting yeah, fat. Right, yeah. I'm going to take the week off, yeah. and the first set, the first bit of fear that sets in because you're going to take a week off. The things that go through your head is the key to unlocking the root cause. Because then, right. what you need to do is unpack that. Yeah. Where does that come from? Where did it? Where did it start? Is it true? Why do I believe it to be true? And start to dive into that. That has to be solved first. You have to figure out why you feel that way why do you think it's necessary because we the, the the science is already out there to prove you can work out two to three times a week eat a balanced nutritional diet and have a phenomenal physique phenomenal if you eat well train two to three times a week in the gym you can build damn near almost any physique that you really want i mean aside from probably competing at the professional level in bodybuilding you can have a, an incredibly sure. healthy physique so it's not whether that's true or not. So what is it 
that makes you feel that you have to do that and then start to dig d- deeper into that, that will give you the answer uh, and then the, the area where you can start to work. Yeah, on. When, I, when I was addicted to exercise, it was all rooted in body image. So it was like, if I miss a day, <clears throat> I'm going to lose muscle. If I miss a day, I'm going to shrink. If I miss a day, I'm not going to be stronger. I'm actually going to get weaker. Um, and that, it's funny because that drive... Here's the irony. The irony is it actually reduced my gains. It actually reduced my body's ability to progress. So because I use the gym as a way to medicate my insecurity, um, and my insecurity being I need more muscle and I need to get stronger, because of that, uh, I was using it inappropriately and ineffectively. I actually built less muscle as a result. I actually had less. I had worse results as a result. That's, that's the funny thing about this is that mm-hmm. – you're going to get – whatever your insecurity is that's driving you to do this, being addicted to the gym is only going to make you look worse or whatever. Now, here's the kicker. That's not how you're going to solve this. So you can't solve this problem by saying, I'm going to work out less because it'll make me look more, better because it's <laughs> going to feed your insecurity even more. Right. Yeah. You have to be comfortable with it. It's interesting, though, because I I had a friend like this, too, where it was like it went from a bull rider, you know, and then went from a, a full-time skateboarder, then went into like this addictive, <clears throat> you know, went through a phase of drugs and then went into, you know, to the gym and then became like ever like always living in the gym, like working on the physique and was just obsessed with it because it was starting to kind of, you know, promote what he thought was like very healthy, but took a long time to, you know, unpack that, like the, that fear of, of not having something that you had to always be doing, you know, and, and like always having to fill that up with something was, you know, part of the problem. So yeah, that, that's going to take a lot of, of soul searching and work. All right, next question is from Becker1127. I want to help my 65-year-old father get back into shape. He has arthritic knees and pain in his lower back that I believe is due to weight gain. What are some routines or techniques you would suggest to get started? Uh, You got to meet him where he's at. That's number one. So be very uh, conscious and honest about where he's at. He's deconditioned, overweight, painful knees. Prime pro. He's probably not exercising at all, and he's probably has a poor diet. Meet him there. Okay, so now that you're where he's at, move him forward just a little bit. Now, as far as exercise routine is, is concerned, Adam's correct. MAPS Prime Pro would be the perfect program to recommend to your dad because it's based entirely on correctional exercise. But besides that, he needs to start very, very slowly. And I can't stress this enough. Do not use your standards to judge what is considered slow. Use your dad's place where he's at. I I made this mistake all the time. I'd get a Mm -hmm. client that would come in totally deconditioned, and I'd be like, oh, okay, three sets of squats. That's that's easy. Let's just do three sets of squats. Then they'd they'd call me and be like, I'm sore. I'm sore. I can't move. I'm sore for five days. And I just wouldn't realize like three sets of squats is easy for me and easy for people who work out, but somebody who never exercises, three sets of squats is way a lot. Mm-hmm. Way too much. What I should have done is one, and then maybe done some stretching and some correctional work, and that would have been much more appropriate. So focus on correctional exercise, number one. With, with nutrition, uh, start very slow. I would say r- rather than taking foods away, uh, start with adding foods in. So rather than saying, hey, Dad, stop eating the pancakes or stop eating this, say, hey, let's have you uh, throw in some steamed vegetables uh, once a day. Let's start with that. That's a great way to start, and it's easier for people to start from there than it is to start restricting right out the gates. Yeah, trying to identify the limitations is everything. And I mean, this is why I've always been like very uh, focused on ways to assess clients and to properly kind of go through the, uh, you know, the functionality of the joints and see where we're healthy, where, you know, the deficiencies lie. And, uh, you know, this was a. I mean, this was everything to me in terms of like having uh, a professional, you know, title behind like being a personal trainer. Like th- it's our job really to be able to help identify these things for people. So that way they know, uh, you know, what they can do and, and what they can build upon and work towards. And so like for us to kind of like wrap our brains to make that, you know, a more simple process, something that's a little more straightforward where you could just have them lie down on the ground and then, you know, just regain access to certain muscles and be able to just lift their hips and then see where there's pain, you know, by moving their legs in certain positions and all that kind of stuff is 
super valuable for somebody like this, where it's like they're riddled with pain. They don't really know like what's going to work, what's not going to work. So uh, again, like kind of coming back to why, you know, Prime Pro is a good suggestion. There's just, it's a simple process of being able to just be in certain positions. Does this hurt? Does this not hurt? Mm. You know, let's build, you know, towards more range of motion, like get your arm to go a little further and, and, and just like go through those channels so that way then we can load the body properly and we can so you know body weight exercises and just kind of like paying real close attention to what your body is telling or what his body is telling him is everything yeah the way i would start because i used to love working with people just like this right 65 or older deconditioned uh pain here's how i used to start them as a personal trainer so let's say your dad comes in asks me about you know what training looks like I would recommend one day a week. That's how I'd start. Hey, you know, Mr. Johnson, I'm going to train you once a week to start with. Now, I knew this. This took me years to figure out, but I realized that once a week was perfect to start with. Now, eventually, I'd get him up to two days or three days, and then I'd get him up to doing some kind of activity on a regular basis. But we would start with once a week. Then when he'd come in, we'd start out with some stretching. We'd start out with some correctional exercise. Um, some correctional exercise movements. I would do some light resistance training movements in between sets. I'd have him move his body. I might do a little myofascial release where I'm pressing on certain muscles. And the first few workouts are very, like he would leave the workout feeling better than when he walked in. The idea was to get him to, to at the end of the workout to go, wow, hmm. I feel really good. I feel more energized. The idea was not to have him at the end of the workout be like, wow, I got my butt kicked. That was a really hard workout. Wrong approach. Very, very slow, uh, but you know, relatively consistent. And the the potential for someone like this to progress is phenomenal. You get someone like this, oh my God, at the end of a year with this very slow incremental approach, he could he could very easily be at the end of the year pain free mm -hmm. um, and feeling like a completely different person. And the value in that is just uh, absolutely tremendous. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides and resources. They're all totally free. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.